So welcome to um, today's lecture for the 13th of uh, April, uh, which is a Monday. Uh, today's uh, topic is um, a um, follow-up to the previous uh, lecture. Previously we spoke about locomotion in general. Today, obviously, we will answer the question of uh, what about us? So today is a human locomotion. Also known as, uh, or better known today, as uh, transportation. And uh, assuming that time allows, we will see that um, this line of thought also empowers us to um, predict the uh, other name for the phenomenon, which is social organization. All these things happen they are natural they are not dictated by Stalin they happen why? we'll see very soon because huge numbers of individuals share objectives or direction of evolutionary design in common and they're not talking to uh, each other. Okay, the, um, <clears throat> the lecture about uh, locomotion in general was illustrated with examples from uh, swimmers, uh, runners, and flyers of all kinds. Uh, best known, of course, to everybody are the animals. Uh, Insects, birds, uh, fish, uh, snakes, all these things, not to mention uh, the terrestrial, especially our pets. So all that is uh, fairly well uh, in hand. And now what about us? We are uh, terrestrial movers. We walk, we run. <clears throat> what have we got to do with, uh, with the quadrupeds? Uh, well, these days, uh, we do a lot of our movement uh, not by walking, but by rolling, meaning we rely on the wheel. So the wheel, this is the alleged uh, human uh, contrivance, is uh, a uh, round object that has evolved in time. In the beginning, uh, excavations were also uh, pieces of art from antiquity show that the, uh, the wheel was, uh, was a solid disc. The wheel has evolved toward being lighter. This means uh, a, uh, a better add-on or artifact for the user of the wheel. The user being not only, well, being the horse that pulls the, uh, the chariot. So uh, the wheel became uh, emptier. In the um, time of Napoleon, it was uh, it was actually quite light with uh, uh, wooden spokes, many wooden spokes. In fact, the wheel making was an art back then. Many many wooden spokes. Uh, watch your old movies; you'll see these uh, designs everywhere. And then uh, in modern times, if you look at the wheels of everything, uh, say automobiles and uh, of course bicycles, but especially motorcycles, meaning faster and faster uh, vehicles, the, uh, the wheel has uh, become even lighter all the way to the fanciest today that have only three spokes. It's kind of interesting. The uh, emblem of uh, Mercedes-Benz uh, 100 years ago turns out to have uh, been predicting the revolutionary direction of the wheel itself. 
So here's the wheel with the axle in the middle, and it's evolution in time toward the lighter, lighter, yeah? Which, uh, of course, means the user being uh, more, uh, uh, more e effective or finding, uh, fi finding it easier to move on the landscape. landscape. Uh, we have my uh, usual uh, icon of the, uh, of the user, in this case a truck with the, uh, the lightest wheel in uh, Dream On. You see this wheel in, uh, in uh, um, speed racing, bicycles too, in, uh, in the Tour de France and other places, in the Olympics in particular, on the Velodrome. Okay, so that is the, uh, the, uh, the meat and potatoes of the human locomotion today on land. And the question to, uh, to, uh, first of all, to myself, in view of the fact that all these things happen, well, uh, is there a better design of uh, the one with three spokes? Well, clearly, the better design would have only two spokes. Now, but two spokes uh, are um, easy to draw, and uh, uh, kind of uh, troublesome in the sense that um, uh, while the upper spoke is in tension, the lower one is in compression, the lighter you make the spokes, the more likely would be that uh, one of them will buckle. So this is not a good design. The better design is the one with uh, the one that avoids uh, this sort of uh, instability called buckling, something of the nature of the previous uh, three. Meaning, how do you make it even lighter? And the answer is uh, still uh, two spokes. But uh, two spokes positioned similarly to any other pair of spokes in the previous designs. So here is that design with two spokes. And uh, that happens to be the bipedal design. This is you. Walking forward, you have uh, two legs, of course, and then uh, you take uh, the next uh, step uh, this way as your uh, imaginary wheel is rolling forward. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, children, uh, I did this myself. We uh, get inside uh, the wine barrel, wine barrel, and run this way inside the one wine, wine barrel in order to make everybody laugh at how the wine barrel was rolling by itself. Um, you, the uh, like the mouse uh, running in the uh, in the cage. So uh, this sort of uh, thinking reveals to you that. Uh, by pedal motion, by pedal motion is the way the wheel happened by itself in nature. So wheel in nature. From this, you can take uh, the uh, the lesson as a as a good joke in all sorts of directions. Such as, uh, so this is bipedal. Meaning that the uh, quadrupedal motion is uh, two of these wheels uh, connected uh, uh, with uh, a uh, horizontal chassis called uh, the animal body. So that's bipedal. Uh, you get the idea. So this is your horse, your uh, ox, ox uh, donkey, whatever. Okay, so this is quadrupedal.
All natural. All two stocks. Every single one, two stocks. This particular uh, uh, aha is in an article that uh, I published and I'm distributing to my students. <coughs> Another one, speaking of uh, people and uh, meaning human locomotion, is for uh, human swimmers. Uh, I, uh, I, with the personal end, I showed that uh, the uh, the reason why. Uh, uh, High-performance swimmers are actually trained to swim with their uh, fingers uh, uh, a little bit open like this. Let me see if I can draw now a real uh, hand. To swim like this is uh, is the way to swim, and the reason is that uh, around the um, the uh, the fingers a uh, a boundary layer of water develops in other words the the bare hand becomes uh, covered by a water glove so the hand naturally acts like a webbed foot, the webbed foot of the duck. Now, a uh, good idea for meaning good advice to for the competitive swimmer to have access, invisible access, or a secret to having a uh, a paddle that's uh, wider than uh, people think. That's one thing. But uh, we see in this uh, reality of uh, let's call it fluid mechanics the origin of the webbed foot. The web foot, uh, in uh, the case of the uh, the duck and other such animals, comes from this um, evolutionary advantage that the uh, animal with uh, with uh, okay fingers or toes spread uh, not too far apart is uh, is a uh, is a more successful animal. In other words, uh, in, in addition to the uh, boundary layer of water. In these uh, armpits, in this case fingerpits, uh, where there is no uh, essentially very little water movement, the skin of the web between the fi the between the uh, the fingers or the toes uh, develops. So webbed um, webbed uh, feet or uh, palms. is a natural revolutionary uh, direction. This is the introduction to today's lecture and it connects with the previous lecture which is about locomotion in general. Now uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the main uh, objective of today's lecture is to show that uh, if you if you rely on this view of uh, the evolution of the design toward being, toward creating easier and easier access, then with, of course, curiosity and ingenuity and the freedom to ask questions, then we're able to predict what is inside the, uh, the, uh, the human uh, mover, the vehicle. What is inside is uh, the uh, constitution or the distribution of organs. Organs internal. Later, as uh, anticipated here, we will look at the uh, organs, meaning organization external to the body of the of the human mover. So let's question what is inside the vehicle? Well, I did the questioning already, and uh, in a paper published by our group in 2014 in the Journal of Applied Physics, which I'm also making available, 
we, instead of looking at the uh, trucks, which I erased, we uh, asked the reader to think uh, of the main organs of, a, of an airplane. So, uh, what are those main organs? Well, the main organs are, uh, let's see, let's imagine this is the airplane coming in toward you. And then, um, well, anyway, that's what it is. It has uh, um, a body, a fuselage, that's uh, kind of bulky looking, uh, more like a pencil that comes toward you. And then uh, the wings. And then hanging from the wings, it has uh, the uh, jet engine. We call the, uh, the, the jet engine a body of a mass uh, M sub E. Uh, the wing uh, has its own uh, mass, but uh, the, wing, the wing's mass is represented uh, best uh, by uh, the mass of the wing when it is full of, with fuel. So the mass of the wing is uh, the amount of fuel that's uh, that's on board, meaning at the uh, at the start of the um, of, uh, of flight or travel, and then um, of course the airplane empty has uh, has a mass to be simple because uh, there's an art to uh, to making uh, a simple model that's not too simple is to assume that the rest is uh, is uh, uh, massless for this particular demonstration. So, right now we uh, we uh, model the uh, the flying body, the vehicle, uh, which, by the way, is a human construct. There are people who made this, and people who ride on it, and people who wait for these people to arrive at destination. This is all a human moving system. Uh, the, the mass of the mover is uh, the sum of two. And uh, we say this, uh, the size of this uh, body is fixed. Now what happens uh, during uh, movement? During movement, the um, The burning of this uh, fuel generates uh, a heat input to the engine. That heat input is uh, proportional to the amount of uh, uh, fuel, MF. The uh, proportionality factor is uh, a quantity that uh, uh, plays the role of heating value of this fuel. In other words, if this is kilograms, then this is joules per kilogram. Here we're talking about joules. And the kilograms. The discussion here is not per unit time. It is for the entire travel of the body from uh, fully loaded to empty at the end. And uh, this particular um, uh, heat input is, uh, of course, used by the engine to generate the work that uh, is necessary for moving the body horizontally on the landscape. So the work, so the work is uh, is the product of the uh, force uh, of uh, resistance encountered by the movie mover times the, uh, the distance of travel, L. So this uh, body has traveled to a distance L. And uh, we'll get to this sort of thing a little bit later. What is the, uh, the work uh, that is being uh, dissipated through the movement? So this is dissipated. That work comes from uh, the engine, which converts this heat input, heat input partially. So uh, this work is uh, equal to uh, the uh, energy conversion efficiency, that's called eta, times Q. In other words, uh, we are uh, now uh, 
finding that um, the uh, oh, by the way, before I continue, uh, there is uh, of course the phenomenon of economies of scale, which I've uh, taught already in, in this uh, sequence of lectures. Economies of scale. which means that the efficiency of a bigger engine is greater than the efficiency of a smaller engine. So that's a zero here, a zero here. Uh, the, uh, there's a cloud of data that um, you could uh, you discover if you look at uh, information about uh, the efficiencies of engines in uh, in uh, uh, sale manuals and all sorts of other places. Again, I can distribute this sort of information um, if asked. The uh, the orientation of these of, the, of this cloud of data is uh, this way because, as you know, the efficiency cannot exceed the Carnot efficiency. So the the distribution is concave. In a uh, narrow or uh, wide enough uh, domain, this sort of behavior of the efficiency is well represented by a power law, which I wrote as uh, C1, and then the mass of the engine. Mass of the engine is uh, either Q or Me. Mass of the engine to um, I just uh, do it this way. The size of the engine is on the abscissa to the power alpha, where alpha is an exponent of uh, order one, but less than one. It has to be less than one so that the the curve is concave. So if you put uh, the um, these uh, formulas together, uh, you uh, Okay, there's one more thing to add, which is the formula for F. F is the uh, force of uh, by which the environment resists being pushed out of the way. So that is uh, a, uh, a force proportional to the weight of the body. The weight is vertical. That's uh, mg. And then, um, and then a factor in front that um, plays the role of friction factor. It's actually more complicated than that, but it's a factor that uh, you've seen in, uh, in the previous lecture. It's a factor that accounts for the median, uh, air versus land versus uh, water. And that means that the, uh, the W, which is the uh, meaning if you eliminate the W between these two formulas, you write the uh, you write A dot Q is the same as uh, FL, which means uh, mu mg L. For a Q, of course, you will replace MF times H. And uh, for eta, you put the uh, this formula, which is uh, C1 m e to power alpha. And so the new bottom line is that the, uh, the movement, the movement, the so-called uh, the uh, motion as a quantity, which is the product of uh, mass moved horizontally times distance, is, uh, you can show, uh, from um, by invoking the um, 
the uh, formula shown here, it is a quantity that's uh, uh, proportional to, um, well, the formula is the following, C1H over mu G, and then the mass of the engine to power alpha, and then the mass of the fuel. See, mass of the engine power alpha, and mass of the fuel. Okay, so this is the uh, guiding conclusion for the remainder of the uh, the story. Let me uh, erase uh, the left half of the blackboard. With uh, this kind of uh, information, including uh, the fact that the total mass is equal to Me plus uh, Mf. We can begin to uh, formulate questions about the internal constitution of the of the um, vehicle, and that means to uh, first of all to answer what is the relative size of uh, engine versus fuel. Well, um, if we call um, uh, Me a certain fraction of the total m, a total, a certain fraction called x, then that means we're calling uh, mf 1 minus x capital M. So that's uh, m uh, here. <coughs> the uh, total movement, as you can see in this uh, concluding box, is proportional to the uh, m e to the power of alpha times mf. Uh, which means, which means that the uh, m times l is proportional to. Uh, obviously, we know from here m e times m f. That is m e to uh, power alpha, and then uh, m f, which means uh, x to power alpha. And then 1 minus x, like that. A quantity like this, of this kind, uh, varies. In other words, ml. Because it is the product of two, uh, two uh, factors, uh, each of uh, a function of x, uh, varying from 0 to 1. The first factor is... Uh, arises this way, the second factor uh, decreases linearly this way. If you uh, multiply these two factors, you get a, uh, a curve that uh, has a maximum, a maximum that, uh, of course, you can obtain uh, analytically by differentiating uh, the product and setting that equal to zero, but this way, you know, you know that uh, the extremal will be a maximum. The point being that uh, the uh, the x, where uh, the the most uh, travel uh, is located, is over a one, but less than one. And that means that uh, the total mass, meaning with this x being a word of one or less than one, it in, uh, empirically it turns out to be, uh, uh, well, as I said, uh, one third or one half uh, in that range. You, uh, you find that uh, these two terms are of the same order of magnitude, or that uh, the, the mass of the engine scales with the mass of the fuel load and, of course, uh, two items of the same order of magnitude uh, add up to a sum that's of the same order of magnitude. So the conclusion is this, that the organs, their sizes, uh, scale with the total size. So when you speak about the size of the airplane, 
Well, uh, you really mean the size of the engine or the size of the fuel load. Uh, that is, if you know the story that's uh, shape, taking shape uh, in this uh, presentation. Okay. What else? What else can you uh, uh, predict about uh, the uh, movement of this now uh, uh, best uh, aircraft uh, that can be? Best because you've balanced uh, the sizes of its two organs. Well, you can, uh, you can predict the range, uh, the range of the, um, of the, uh, of the vehicle. You, you get that from, uh, from this relationship here, ML. So range, range means L. Well, from ML, varies as uh, m e to alpha times m f however uh, both uh, masses scale with the total mass of the uh, of the vehicle so that means uh, m to 1 plus uh, alpha which means that the range l Scales as the body mass to power alpha. Said another way, the bigger travel farther. In this case, fly farther. Not bad, huh? We also know that the bigger also fly faster. The bigger, meaning the speed of this uh, aircraft, this is the subsonic in this case, uh, increases or depends on body mass as uh, body mass to power one sixth. Well, let's play this game a little bit in anticipation of uh, my next lecture. Um, Let's look at the travel time, V, which is of course L over V, would be, would be um, this L, which is M to alpha, divided by M to one sixth, which is of course another um, Body size dependent depending quantity uh, that is alpha minus one sixth. If alpha is uh, you know uh, something like half or two thirds, then uh, the uh, the lifetime of the aircraft on the route. Scales with the body size to a power of order one, but less than one. So, uh, longer uh, for the bigger. You see, question after question, simple result after simple result. This conclusion that the bigger fly farther, airplanes. The bigger fly longer in time. Airplanes. These discoveries give you the idea that you know a lot more about everything, including the animal realm. Bigger animals move farther. And in so doing, they live longer. But they also have other things that are, that mean organs that are bigger when the animal is bigger. They have bigger motors, that is uh, a bigger musculature, and they also have a, a bigger a fuel load, which means a bigger appetite, or obviously bigger uh, quantities of uh, food intake. So this is the, uh, the path of uh, discovery, just a second. Uh, and uh, it is not the end. 
They can ask uh, a few other things. For example, um, what else can we say about the uh, architecture of the airplane in this case? Well, uh, the, uh, let me first uh, make uh, a space. And uh, replace this drawing with one that's um, uh, even simpler, one that has the dimensions, the length scales that characterize this uh, this uh, uh, flying body. So there is a fuselage of uh, a particular cross section called A. It's moving to the left. With that speed B. And then uh, the uh, wing that you see is uh, it's got uh, uh, its own length scale, so I'll just sketch uh, uh, this uh, one for view is called the span, the wing span. Uh, the wing has a thickness. And uh, the third dimension is the uh, swept length of the wing. Furthermore, the, um, the fuselage has a length in the direction of uh, movement. And to make a drawing uh, of this kind, you need to have the proportions uh, to uh, the sketch. Uh, for example, the um, the proportion of uh, uh, wingspan to fuselage length, or uh, the uh, proportions of the cross section of the uh, of the uh, of the fuselage. If this is the height h, then the horizontal dimension. Let's call it the x. So what would be uh, uh, h over x? And a few other things you see in the drawing. Okay, um, these uh, questions come from uh, evoking once again the direction of evolutionary design, which is toward easier access. That is uh, easier uh, to the movement to the left, <coughs> and we get the. Uh, the ideas of how to uh, engineer that uh, easier access in the case of the airplane, we do the engineering. If we look at the, um, at the drag force, the force, the resistance encountered by the object, it is in dimensionless terms expressed as uh, the force divided by the uh, dynamic pressure head uh, uh, faced by the airplane. It has uh, this uh, quantity, dimensional, it has two contributions. Uh, one is due to the first fuselage, the other one to the wing. By the way, I drew only one wing. This, uh, this wing accounts for both wings. So, because remember, in scale analysis, uh, uh, two wings uh, are, uh, are one wing. They have the same length scale. One plus one uh, equals one in scale analysis. Uh, but you have to understand the uh, technique uh, before you start laughing at the statement of that kind. And uh, we have uh, uh, the, uh, from the first fuselage, uh, we have uh, a contribution due to the uh, uh, frontal uh, cross section, which is A. From the um, wings themselves, we have a uh, a contribution, no, no, also from the fuselage we have a skin friction uh, that's uh, integrated over the surface. That is uh, accounted for in terms of a skin friction coefficient, a, uh, a weighted perimeter P and the length of the fuselage. So this is for the fuselage. Uh, the weighted perimeter is uh, this line. 
And then from the wing, the contribution is uh, is uh, similarly uh, 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 identified for the frontal uh, for the frontal uh, cross section is the product of uh, span times uh, thickness. And then for the uh, skin friction, it is the uh, skin friction coefficient. And then the uh, surface shown here, which is the wingspan times the sweat length. So that's for the wing. Now, uh, there are some uh, easy conclusions that uh, emerge right away. The, um, the area, for, well, the area that's um, uh, smallest Well, anyway, area is area, so uh, we can, uh, in fact, we start the other way. The, the weather perimeter that's smallest, uh, when the area is fixed, it happens when the uh, cross-section is roundish. For example, uh, circular, or a, a close to circular oval. So that means uh, if... Uh, uh, X and L are equal to the same uh, diameter uh, looking at dimension, then the P is uh, called B, and then that means that A is called B squared. So the first conclusion is that uh, the cross section of uh, flyers, meaning their bodies, in cross section should look roundish, like all the airplanes and, of course, uh, all the birds. So uh, that's one conclusion. The uh, your section has one length scale. Uh, the other one, uh, just to make like, life uh, easier for skin friction coefficient at a fixed uh, speed, uh, one that's high enough, meaning high Reynolds number flow, uh, subsonic, you have uh, a, uh, a order of magnitude of uh, say 10 to the minus 2. Uh, in any case, a factor that's essentially, let me say, practically constant. And uh, and okay, what else do you do with this uh, sort of uh, uh, conclusion? You. Uh, you also uh, recognize the so-called constraints, the finite size constraints uh, from before. Uh, for example, the, the total uh, mass of the flying body is fixed. That means uh, M, capital M, is the mass of the uh, body. In this case, uh, the fuselage, mass of the fuselage plus the mass of the wings. And uh, that's uh, one thing you can uh, you can write. Uh, the uh, you already know that the uh, the mass of the wing scales as the uh, as the uh, as the mass of the body itself. You know that from the uh, from the previous discussion. And uh, and then uh, based on this. Uh, this uh, previous discussion, you conclude that the body mass of the whole thing is uh, expressible as uh, the volume as you see it. For example, the volume of the, uh, the fuselage. Uh, and then with a uh, density factor in front, that re represents the density of the whole thing averaged over the whole volume. So that's the density of uh, fuselage and uh, wing average. So there's a, a constraint, if you will, 
meaning that the product that this square times L is, uh, is fixed. And then finally, <coughs> meaning it's not finally yet, there are two more things to, uh, to uh, account for. Um, and I'm going to write them with white chalk here. One is that, uh, well, there are two, those two things are the equilibrium of forces in the vertical direction. This is for the flyer. And then there will be another condition having to do with uh, the rotation the equilibrium of the wing. Uh, the uh, vertical equilibrium uh, is the requirement that the, um, the downward force due to weight, mg, is balanced by the um, upward force due to lift provided by the wings. And the lift is uh, from uh, aerodynamics is uh, has the order of magnitude uh, one half um, density of air, and then the speed of uh, of the mover a so-called lift coefficient. And then the area of the um, of the wing seen from above. So you see here a uh, formalized one relating the constant on the left to the expression on the right. Except that the constant on the left depends on um, is actually this uh, product d squared times L. So rho d squared times L. Let's call this uh, this uh, vertical equilibrium uh, condition the uh, formula number one. And then uh, formula number two. Is the uh, requirement that uh, the the wing, uh, as I drew it here, is uh, in a rotational equilibrium? I'm going to um, to sketch it uh, one more time. And uh, rotational equilibrium means it is um, it is. Uh, well, the lift, which is the right hand side shown here, a force right hand side, is uh, trying to rotate the wing that way with a moment equal to this uh, right hand side force times the arm, which is the, the uh, span. Uh, why is uh, the wing not rotating? It is not rotating because uh, in its uh, plane of uh, implantation, the wing is, uh, is pulled to the left by um, tensile forces sigma, or S in uh, chapter 10, and then pushed to the right, along the bottom, I'm talking about the cross section, by the same uh, uh, stress uh, length scale S. And these, uh, these uh, forces themselves, uh, in fact, uh, I should have drawn them the other way around, um, meaning this way. And the other way, you get the idea. These uh, stresses uh, create a, a, a balancing uh, a moment, which has the uh, order of magnitude of the force times arm. The force is uh, the stress 
times the area of the cross section, <coughs> which is uh, T times uh, LW. And then the arm of uh, this uh, kind of force is T itself. So uh, we have uh, this uh, moment balancing the previous one. The previous one is this expression uh, shown here. This is the right hand side. So we can substitute that the expression there <coughs> times the arm S. And so this uh, rotational equilibrium condition is condition number two. And uh, and now, uh, <laughs> without um, getting into uh, too much details, too many details, and also spending too much time, uh, I will uh, provide the, uh, the PDF of the journal article to tell you that if you combine all the formulas that I put on the blackboard, you obtain a rather easily a set of results that have to do with the configuration of the flying body. Obviously, not only airplane, but bird. And the results are the following. These are in addition to the results with which the lecture began. Uh, one is that the, the uh, transversal uh, thickness of the fuselage uh, should the scale with the fuselage length. It should be of order CF over 2, which means uh, of order 1, but less than 1. Clearly, the fuselage should be like this uh, piece of chalk. You know that from the back of the envelope uh, reasoning. Uh, we already know uh, that the A should be uh, uh, D squared. That's, uh, in other words, a roundish. And um, And then finally, finally, this is the most interesting of all of all the conclusions, the, the wingspan should uh, scale as uh, the body mass to power minus 1 over 12, which means uh, uh, Essentially a constant because this exponent is uh, is uh, close to meaningless, so constant. Altogether, these conclusions uh, mean one thing: that regardless of size, the drawing of the flying body uh, should be. Uh, similar to other drawings of flying bodies. In other words, the drawing itself is, uh, broadly speaking, uh, size independent. So, drawing or design configuration uh, So I will not use the word design because it gets some people upset. Configuration is is uh, size independent, or that all flyers uh, should uh, look uh, basically the same. You see, from theory, in this case, from invoking the constructor law of the evolutionary direction toward greater axis, we uh, <laughs> we predict we predict that um, that uh, airplanes should evolve uh, in their own way. And the fact that they happen to look like uh, other flyers is uh, is nature itself. It doesn't mean that uh, aircraft designers uh, from everywhere, Germany, the U.S., uh, I'm talking about the history of uh, 
of uh, aircraft technology, and then the USSR uh, have been, uh, you know, copying from each other. Especially, they have not been. Uh, it doesn't mean that they were looking at birds as they made <laughs> these uh, these great inventions. They're simply they're simply answering the question of how can we fly more and more easily and also more safely because when you invoke the strength of uh, a loaded uh, structure you are actually talking about safety you don't want the airplane to uh, to break into two pieces in flight that is the uh, the, uh, the main message of this lecture it is that with uh, with the uh, with the uh, physics with a principle your mind takes you farther and faster in this direction of evolutionary design if you happen to be uh, employed in um, in technology which means technology evolution with principle and with a, with a matter of this course you are empowered to fast forward in your own mind the evolution of uh, that technology. You become a visionary. Unknown to everybody else is the fact that you possess a crystal ball in which you see the future of not only your profession, but the future of your movement, which means your own life, and actually the future of uh, the population around you. So with this, I uh, say goodbye. Until next time, when I will, uh, I will start with uh, predicting social organization. Thank you.